Okay, let's read First Peter now. Let's just read from verses 1 to 9. Alright, First Peter verses 1 to 9, 1 to reading. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers get scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though ye now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us turn to God in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for safe travel to thy house, and we thank you for keeping us um, through the week. We do ask as we come that you cleanse us and wash us of all our sins. Lord, get, as we gather, may you search our hearts and show us our sins that we may confess and repent. Lord, we also ask that you would enlighten our minds through the understanding of your word as we enter into this new book. Use this new book to transform our lives. This is your word. Your Holy Spirit must help. And grant to us obedient and willing hearts and receptive minds and also attentive ears. So help us now as we study. Be with every group in thy house. Father, we ask and pray that you bless this series for thy name's sake, for your glory's sake, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> So the book of, of Peter, the book of Peter. Now, um, sometimes when we do especially letters, this is what I like to get the people to do. We did this at Regen also. Now, for, the first, for this first epistle of Peter, question number one, um, I want you to write an outline of First Peter and submit it the next lesson at October. Right? I forgot, next lesson, not next October not next year, this coming October, next lesson, that is the 11th of October. Plenty of time, right? 11th of October, plenty of time. Can Phoebe? Oh, Phoebe looks panicking now. Right? She's perspiring. <laughs> now, the younger ones, all right? So younger ones like Phoebe, um, you can ask your parents to help you, okay? You show this paper to mommy, daddy, daddy, mommy, pastor say, help me with writing an outline. Okay, but you must do your part. Okay, don't just say, all right, I'll come back and look for you on the 10th of October. Okay, so you must do your part. Now, what is an outline? Why do we want to do an outline? Outlines are very useful. Outlines are very important. <coughs> outlines forces you to think through every chapter and how to section the chapters to what it is talking about. Then it gives you an overall picture of the book, right? When you have an overall... Let me ask you, what's the advantage of having an overall picture of the book? All right, we start here. What's the advantage, Michelle? Uh, you know what you're looking at. Very good. You know what you're looking at. All right, you, you, know, you know the overall picture, overall theme. Then every verse you read becomes a lot more meaningful, right? You can relate it to why this book is written. You, it becomes richer. All right, so that's why I want you to write. But very importantly, I want you to learn to do that. Now, every time you do your personal devotion. All right. Um, uh, Shani, what book are you on now for your personal devotion? Proverbs. Okay, very difficult. All right. Or like maybe you're doing Philippians. Um, before you start your devotion on a book, try and force yourself to write an outline. 
you're not in a hurry, right? You, you don't have to finish your devotion book with a limited time. If not, the book might disappear or something. No? You have time. So take your time, read through the whole book. Now, what, what does it entail? So it's very useful for you. Please do it. Okay? Do you do that in school? Book reviews? No. Sometimes. Okay. Now, what, what do you need to do? Um, basically, when you give me the paper that you have, so I'm going to have a lot of paper to mark. Right? So I'm the one who's going to suffer. Now, what you can do is, you can write the author, which you'll find out today. Then you can write the theme, which you'll find out today. So you see, I already do the easy part, the difficult part for you, especially the theme. And then you can write the verses, like one, chapter 1, verses 1, 2, x. x, x, all right? Then in here, you're, you are going to describe the key thought. Or we call it the topic statement, correct? We, you've been doing DHW, the topic statement. What is the topic being discussed here? All right, make a statement about it. Don't cut and paste the verse there. Right? So what is it talking about? And then, so this forces you to section. Then you say one, um, bit, okay, just for example, one, one, two, two, for example. Huh? And then one, three, two, x. Okay? And then again, you write. Okay? Now, keep in mind the theme. Keep in mind the theme. It helps you. Have you ever been in conversation with someone and then the person talk, 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 where say, I don't know where this is going, I don't know why the person is talking about that. Right? Because you, you, you missed the, the, the theme that the person was talking about. Right? So with the theme, it kind of helps you. All right, so now one of the useful ways is to read the entire chapter first. So step one, read the whole chapter at one go. Just can read at one go, maybe once or twice. All right, I suggest at least twice. Yes, Caleb. Are you allowed to? Can't hear you. Go over. Do it with your sibling. Yes, yes, yes. You can. All right. So you, but you. Why don't you try yourself first? All right. You try. All right. You try. You you try, and after that you can discuss with your sibling. But try try to do your own. All right. All right. You know. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Do we actually need to print this out and submit it with our name? Then? Yes. Yes. Okay. The author is not you. Uh, the author is Peter. Right. The author is Peter. All right. Yes, put your name and all that. I'll read it and I'll give you some input. Do you want? Okay. Do you okay. Have a font size? <laughs> Any font size? <laughs> Handwriting, hand, handwritten also accepted. Will be accepted as well. As long as I read it, alright? Now, so read the whole chapter first. <clears throat> Even better, if, if I were you, I would normally read the whole book. It's only five chapters. Is it five? I think so. It's only five chapters, very short. Just two pages in the Bible. That's it. Read the whole book, read the chapter, and then start writing. This, this is one of the best things that, that I've learned in my life. Um, it really helps me and I enjoy doing my devotion a lot more because now I have an overall picture and everything that I read becomes a lot more meaningful. I know why the Apostle wrote about that. Okay? It's very useful. Okay, so... Um, Submit it on the 11th. Any questions? No? Uh, this statement should be, should, be, should be sharp. I won't say short, but it must at least be sharp. But don't be like one whole paragraph. Okay, concise. Okay, concise. You know it's concise? Sharp and accurate and short, compact. Okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, if you're not sure, then I'll talk to your daddy and mommy, all right? Phoebe, don't worry. You can try, Ilim? Okay, good. All right, so this will be your... Who has done this before? No. All right, we did it in one of the books before, all right? So please try. Please try. If you have any question along the way, ask me. Yes. Is teamwork allowed? Is teamwork allowed? No. <laughs> not for the... Not for anyone who is above <laughs> eight-year-old or nine-year-old. Or 10 year old. Alright? Not allowed. 
Okay, you pray. Please learn, all right? Read, before you read, pray. This is the Word of God. Pray, Lord, please help me to understand. May your Holy Spirit help me to understand. Then after some time, you, you begin to realize you understand better and better. You like to read the Bible, okay? All right, so don't worry. Just try. Don't worry. All right, don't embarrass. If you do not want to submit, it's fine too. <laughs> okay, I don't want you to stop turning up for Bible study. All right, I'm not coming anymore. You just try. You want to submit for me to help you? I'm more than willing to help you. If you feel that you want to write and on that day just bring, you can bring. I'll, I'll bring mine as well. Okay, then I run through. Okay? Alright, good. Now, next one. Now then we start. Alright, now we start. <coughs> now, give some background regarding this epistle. So, before jumping into it, it's good for you to understand some background of the epistle. Alright? Now, epistle is a letter. Epistle is a letter written um, by the apostle to the people. Now, what are some of the background um, that we should know about? Now, when, when was it written? Anyone can guess? When was it written? Now, it's roughly around, most people believe, 63 or 64 AD. All right, 63 or 64 AD. So this will be quite long after our famous last chapter of John, right? Because the last chapter of John is when the Lord went to heaven and then the apostles started to serve, right? So it's, it's some tens of years after that. Um, so about 64, 63, 64 AD. So that is roughly. Now, who's the writer? Obviously, it is. Is it, a, is it Peter? Why do you think it's Peter? Um, Chloe, why do you think it's Peter? The Apostle Peter. Why do you think so? Always look at what? Always look at the Bible. Why do you think it's Peter? Because it begins with that. Right? It begins with the Apostle saying, Peter, an Apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers gathered. Right? So obviously it's Peter. Peter said, I, the Apostle, writing this to the people. Right? So the author, Peter. Peter. Now having said it's Peter really the author? What do you think, CP? Is Peter the author? God is the author. This is the Word of God, right? So whenever we read the Bible, God is the author, right? These are the writers. Okay, maybe on the change you can put write the, the writer. Author is God. The, but God used Peter to write it. Okay, the thoughts are from God, right? Is the thoughts Peter's thoughts or God's thoughts? God's thoughts, all right? Now, so God. Now, <clears throat> but um, over time, now, some liberal um, theologians, we are going to study what, what, are, what is liberalism um, next Friday, God willing, or following Friday. Now, some liberal scholars um, over time began to say that it is not, it can't be written by Peter. It can't be written by Peter. And the reasons they cite is that Peter is a fisherman. The Greek here, it's written in Greek, all right? We have a translation. The, the Greek here is very beautiful, very um, well written, very uh, articulate. How can a fisherman write that? So they say, can't be Peter. Okay? So that's one of the reasons they cite. Can't be Peter. Can it be Peter? Because the author is who? The author is God. God is the one who gives him the thoughts and he writes it out. All right? The, the Bible is the. Okay, let's start next. Susan, the Bible is? It's God's word, all right? It's not Peter's word, it's God's word. Can God make Peter write in very beautiful Greek? Yes. Now, please don't think, uh, Pete, that when, they say, when they say, oh, these are fishermen, they are unlearned, right? In Acts, they are unlearned. Do you know what's the meaning of unlearned? What do you think? The, the people say, oh, these are fishermen, they are unlearned. So they say, well, even the Jews say that they are unlearned. How could Peter write that? What does unlearned mean? Uneducated. Uneducated. We always think uneducated. Yes, it can be uneducated, but what they are saying is, you see, these are the religious leaders. They look at Peter, and Peter stood up and preached the gospel, uh, preached 
from the Old Testament, and they say these are unlearned people. What they meant is this, they were not educated like us as religious leaders. We went to our, um, our um, Bible school, so to speak, and all that. But Peter, he did not go to any of our <coughs> Sanhedrin training. Right? How can they know anything about God? So when they say unlearned, that is what they meant. They're not saying they do not know alphabets and they do not know how to write and their, their Greek is very poor. They simply mean that well, they are not schooled in, theo in theo theology like us, the religious leaders. Is it true they were unlearned? Yeah. Sorry, I forget your name. I remember again. Say again. Eileen. Now, Eileen, do you think they were unlearned when it comes to the things of God? Yeah. Peter. Peter. Do you think Peter was unlearned when it comes to the things of God? Untrained. Yeah, in the eyes of them. But why you say not really, Jen? Why, why not? Yeah, why not? They didn't go to all these religious leaders, temple training and all that, you know? Excellent answer. They were personally trained by the Lord Jesus. They were trained by the Lord Jesus. They lived side by side with the Lord Jesus for years. The Lord taught them personally. Would you prefer to be taught by a man, a really well-known religious leader, or the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Definitely. The, so they knew. They knew scriptures even better than this. They understood, rather, better than these religious leaders. That's why many times the Lord had to correct these religious leaders, correct? Now, why do I want to bring up all this? You have to understand one thing about Christianity today. Some of you may not be aware. Many of the books in the Bible are called to question. Means people say, uh, it's not written by Peter. Uh, the first five books are not written by Moses uh, and all that. And then over time it became, anyway, I think, you know, all these people, actually it's, it's not true. Someone makes some changes. Imagine, uh, if, if you are not a Christian. All right, Hazel, if you are not a Christian, say you are not a Christian. Okay. Don't, name any don't name any religion. You're not a Christian. And then you hear all the Christians themselves say, you know, although the book begins, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, but it's not written by Peter. If you're not a Christian, how would you feel about the Christian Bible? Say again. Useless. Why useless? Cannot be trusted. It's a book of lies. It says Peter too, but Christians themselves say, no, it can't be. The Bible becomes a joke, right? But actually, over time, the Bible did become a big question mark even in believers' mind. I kept telling you recently, there are many big names, they have left the Christian faith. And they stated, how do we know the Bible is true? The famous Hillsong writer, he said, the Bible seems to have many errors, you know, how can I trust it anymore? So, the reason why I bring this up is to cause you to be aware. There are Christians, Christian Bible colleges, that cast doubts on all these things. Right? So, we simply take it, this is God's word, God says Peter, an apostle, and two, then it is Peter. That's it. Now, the first five books is written by who? Who wants to try? Um, uh, Elaine, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Moses, right? Christ himself talked that, the New Testament itself says Moses is the writer, but many Bible colleges teach that these five books could not have been written by Moses, that kind of thing, All right? So we just need to know if the Bible says it was written by Moses, that settles it. Otherwise, it becomes a problem. Okay, so when it comes to the Word of God, we have to understand that. That is why I bring this up. So, author <coughs> Peter, as we take it from the Bible, very simply, very clearly. Now, what else? From what you read, I ask you, from what you read, what do you think the book is about? Just from the first nine verses. If you want, you can look at it. This is an open book question. What do you think the, the, the book is about? Ah, yes, next. 
you got the good question. Um, Brenda. It's, the book is about our salvation. Uh, say more. Um, from the election to justification to sanctification. Okay. Um, and the whole book you think is about that? It's about Christian living. About Christian <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Definitely would be right. <laughs> okay, we'll move to the back. Ichung. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll be reading, I'll be interested to read your outline. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say yes? similar in like the, uh, the sanctification of the Christian, so um, Christian growth and maturity. Christian growth and maturity, yes. So, I mean, you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm just teasing you. You're right, it includes those things. But in what context? That's the question. In what context? <laughs> uh, Jeremy. In what context? Um, say again? In trials. Why do you say in trials? Verse 7. Verse 7. Let's read verse 7 together. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Okay, very good. So we know. We know it is about. So I'm, I'm teaching you to do devotion. Huh? When you do devotion, you want to think what is this book about? You can't do a devotion without knowing. So, number one is <coughs> Christian growth. Alright? That's what. Um, Brenda mentioned Christian growth, Christian living, right? Christian growth, Christian living. Then, um, Jeremy, the, the context, <coughs> the context. So, if you have a content, all right, the context is trial of, is it just trial? But it's trial of your faith. What's the difference between just trial and trial of your faith, Joshua? Yes, trial is just trouble in life, correct? But trial of your faith, now the context has to do with their Christian living. Because they live out their Christian faith, they face trials, correct? So there's a difference. Now many people look to the Bible for solutions in life. You know solutions in life? means uh, I have all these difficulties in life, um, how do I handle them? They look for trials, solution to trials. But the Bible is always about trials of your faith, all right? about the Christian living. Is it about, is it about um, <clears throat> I can't play basketball. I want to be good in basketball. And I feel very discouraged that I don't play basketball well. Let me flip. Let me flip. Ah, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Wow, I can. Right? People look at all, they look for that kind of things. But the Bible is always about the trial of the Christian life. Right? That is what God is trying to help us in. Okay? So, another one. Now, next. Uh, Marco. Now, Marco. In all this, what is the outcome? What is the outcome that is desired? Alright, so we have content, we have context, and we have culmination. Culminating in what? Salvation of the soul. Why do you say that? Verse 9. At the end, receiving the end, the faith, end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Um, yes, so we have um, salvation of your souls. But really, is it about that? Next. Joash. Huh? Josiah. Thinking of Joash too much. Jo Josiah. Strengthening of faith, 
Well, strengthening our faith will be here. Now, I'm, I'm trying to get you to think, huh? because you can't read the Bible without thinking. You'll miss so many things. Next. Aaron. Incorruptible. Say again. Incorruptible, Incorruptible verse. Or the trial of your faith is incorruptible. So you have... Now, I would say that um, the salvation, the incorruptible, are all really in, in the context of the trial of your faith. But what is the ultimate culmination of everything? Okay, this is too simple. I know everybody here is dying to say it. <laughs> all right, say it. Okay, <laughs> finally it's out, to glorify God. But where do you find it? Where do you find it? Verse 7. Verse 7, very good, thank you. Now let's read, the la now, let's read verse 7. Now, verse 7 is one of the key verse in, the, in, in this book. Alright, so let's read it again. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Right? So look here. The culmination is all this. Your salvation, the incorruptible faith and all that. What is it all for? That at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be to the praise and honour and glory of God. Right? That is what this book it's about. So Peter kind of introduced it in the beginning. So when we are studying, this is what it's going to be. Alright, so now you give the answer. With these three, with these three, you form this statement for, for your the thing. Alright, you form this statement. Now the theme. So in the beginning, Paul, uh, Paul, Peter already said, this is why I'm writing to you. <coughs> now follow, alright, follow, follow. Please follow. In the beginning, verse 1, Peter says, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I write to these Christians. They are scattered. Okay? Then he says, <coughs> um, And you all are elect. You all are saved by God's election. Okay? Then he says, and then he praised God for that, about how you're, how you're saved. And then he says, you're elected to an, verse 4, elected to an incorruptible um, um, undefiled inheritance. Okay, so you pretend I'm Peter. Alright, you pretend I'm Peter. Okay, you pretend I'm Peter and I'm talking to you. Hey, all of you, all of you that are scattered everywhere, scattered in Curtin, scattered in UWA, scattered, all oh, you're scattered everywhere. Alright, all the elect I'm writing to you. And I said, well, I really thank God for saving us. Do you know that God saved you all? Whether you're in Curtin or, or, or in UWA or in what's your school? Yeah? In real both, you know, or, or wherever you are, God intends to give you an in inheritance that is incorruptible. You're scattered everywhere. And then after that, I say, you know, you rejoice greatly. Are you rejoicing greatly? That I thank God I'm safe. But it says, but now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness. I know life is difficult in UWA. You know, they don't like Christians there. We are both a bit different. You know, if need be, maybe you're not in tribulation. No one making fun of you. Alright, except pastor at church. Right? I don't, right? No, no making fun of you. But he says, but, but you know everybody, everybody, then he comes to verse 7. But you know, all these things that happen to you wherever you are, you're being tested for your Christian life. You're being tested for your Christian life. And all these things are very precious, you know. Treasure it. Treasure it. Because all this will end up to the honour and glory, praise and honour and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand? And then after that, he's going to start his detailed writings. Okay? So now you know that. The theme. You have three, the three things. So, so... We are thought through now by the Apostle Paul, eh, Apostle Peter. Now you write the theme. What is the theme? Ah, okay, I'll continue. Okay, Caleb, I think it's a bit difficult. You want to try the theme? You know what's the theme? Not amusement park. Huh? Theme, you know what's the theme? 
No, no. Theme is like the key overall uh, main point of something, the theme. All right, this is the key thing that they want to say. Theme, all right? You know, theme, T-H-E-M-E, -E, all right? Okay, next. You want to try, Ilim? You put all these three together. Ilim can see or not. Put all these three together and form a theme statement. Too difficult this side, all right. Uh, Jennifer. You're looking down because you're afraid or you're trying? You want a theme? What's a theme? You understand how to do this? Theme. So all your thing huh, is coming to you. Theme. Want to try? Or wait for the bigger test to try? Wait, okay. Anna, want to try? The theme. Now you tell the whole story, it, these three key points in, in one concise statement. Yes. Imagine you go home tonight. Your mom asks you, Anna, what did you learn? What's the theme of the book? Ah, I remember these three things. And how do I describe it in one short statement? It was about Peter. <laughs> okay, don't want to try. All right, here. You want to try? Uh, I'm sure you got it. Who? Wow, Enoch. All right, Enoch. Well done. Yes. Wow, you're very concise. Just one word. Uh. <laughs> Just one faith. What about faith? <laughs> don't get tempted. Very good. So, mommy asks you, what do you learn? It's about faith. Don't get tempted. When what? Um, when temptation comes. When temptation, trials are temptation. When temptation comes, don't get tempted. Why? Why don't you want to get tempted? You fall into sin. When you fall into sin, so fall into sin, but what will happen? Uh, get just died. <laughs> okay. Right answer still. Alright, alright. So, so he, he helped us in the first part already. Faith. Okay, come here. You want to try? Kenny. It, um, the purpose of the trial of Christian faith is uh, to glorify God. The purpose of Trial of, of the Christian faith is to glorify. glorify God. Okay, do we have trial of the faith? Trial of the faith. Alright? Do you have growth? What about growth? Ah, miss out something already. But you have this. Alright? Glorify God. Alright, next. Should I add on to that? You can. Uh, in Christian living. Okay, in Christian living. Growth is done through trial of faith. Mm -hmm. So that you can glorify God at the end. Okay, so something like that. You can be that. Who wants to try next? All right, Shinrei, quick, quick. Christian growth and living. Christian living for what is this? too fast. Say again. <laughs> Christian living and growth in the context of trials of faith for the purpose of the glory of God. Mm. It's for the purpose of the glory of God. Okay, something like that. All right, so you get the picture. Okay, so I want to see your theme. All right, I want to see your theme. I won't give you mine until until um, you come back. All right, so get some idea, Phoebe. You understand following. So when you when you start reading a book, you can go through this process. Just sing and then write down the theme. Now, everything that you write now... Okay, did you know this was the book of Peter? You never knew, right? Now you know. Is it something that's important? Yes. Now, at least I know First Peter, what is First Peter is about. And everything that I read, now I can link it to this. It won't be, why is Peter saying this? I don't know. I'm lost, right? When you're lost, are you interested? When you're lost, I don't know, just keep... Right? But when you when you ah you get more and more. Okay? Then you then you learn. You learn. And more importantly, you know where you are going. You know what you are trying to achieve. This is the culmination. I know I am trying to achieve one thing to glorify God in my responses. Correct? 
in all my responses in trials, I now have a very clear aim, correct? Now, I give you an example. I give you an example. You turn to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Okay, chapter 2. Uh, let's read, for example, let's read verse 13. Let's read verse 13. Submit yourselves, chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king or supreme. Now, you notice one thing. The book of Peter actually tells you to obey the government. Right or not? To obey the government. Now, with this, you realize that obeying the government is so that, so that what? You will glorify God. Is it true or not? If you're an obedient citizen, I'm not saying if they ask you to go and kill, to kill people, you go and kill people. You're an obedient citizen. All right? You pay your taxes, you keep within the speed limit, Jeremy, and all those things. All right? Then you're a good testimony, right? Will the government like you? Now, I want you to read with me. Um, where's this? Okay, but anyway, so, so, so do you understand? Now, now you can link things. Or when you read verses that you struggle with. Let's read verse, verse, um, verse 11. Let's read verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. But I like computer games. You know, do you like computer games? No. Are you sure? Good. All right. Oh, I, I like, I like all these things that I know I should not as a Christian, all right? I like to watch things that I should not be watching. Oh, all these are, why must I give it up? Then you look at here again. It is all about my growth. It is all about living a life that will glorify God. Then I have a clear motivation. It's not just struggling, 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 okay? All right, so that's an example. Now, let's continue quickly. Let's start on some things. So you understand what to do, huh? Now, the next, let me see any other, I'm fine. Um, okay, that was question number two, am I right? Okay, let me give you some more background, all right? Okay, some more background is this. Now, Peter lived at a time, do you know who was ruling? Which Roman emperor? Those, who, do, who does history in, in school? Which Roman emperor? Yes, which Roman emperor? Yeah? Starts with N. Nebuchadnezzar? Can't be, right? Yeah? Nero, very good. Nero. Right, Nero. Now, who was Nero? Was Nero uh, uh, an emperor that was very kind to Christians? What do you think? Enoch. He loved Christians. No, Nero was a very, very wicked emperor, Roman emperor. Very wicked Roman emperor. You think, remember we say this, the, is the context is trials, persecutions. You turn to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Verse 6. Now, how bad was the persecution? He said, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Heaviness. You know what is heaviness? They ate until they grew very fat. Now, this heaviness means their hearts were very heavy. They were under a lot of pressure and, and, and stress, all right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> With manifold temptations, not just temptations, but all sorts of temptations. Temptations can mean persecutions, can mean temptation to sin. All right? So all these things. Now, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Linked to Nero, for example. Now, why do you think Nero was persecuting Christians? Um, Chloe, why do you think Nero was persecuting Christians? Any idea? Huh? Say again? They don't like Christians. Why don't you like Christians? Why? Usually government want them to want everyone to turn to them. Now, not to. Uh, not to 
not to God. Now, especially for, the, for some of these Roman emperors, they, they have this concept of the emperor is God. Understand that? The emperor is God. All right? So they, they are expected to worship the emperor like God or a, a God. Okay? Um, so they're expecting to worship Caesar and, and see them as demigods. So who do they call Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus, right? The Christians call it Lord Jesus. But for the Romans, when they say Lord Caesar, it is not just like, oh, Master Caesar. To them, it is that Lord is the same kind of Lordship like Jesus as divine, as deity, understand? So when they say Lord, when they call them Lord, the Empress Lord, is really saying that you are a God, equivalent to like Christ. So when the Christians, now the Christians, do the Christians call their masters Lord? You read in the Bible, they do. Right? They do call their masters Lord. If they are slaves, they call their master Lord. But when it comes to the Roman, they would not use that term. They would refuse. Because to them, it is a sign of worship, acceptance of worshipping them. They have no problem calling their master, if they are slaves, Lord so and so. But when it comes to the emperors, they would not. Okay, it's equivalent to, to acknowledging that Jesus is not the Lord, the only God. Okay, so lots of persecution. Now, th how wicked was Nero? You know, do you know how wicked was Nero? The, uh, the no. He killed Christians. Now he's the kind of emperor that would, that would laugh and have fun. All right, the city is very dark. It's very dark tonight. Go grab some Christians to do what? Tie them up and use them like street lamps. How? Plug a light bulb? No. They burn them. They just light them up with fire and burn them and use them to light up the city. And he would laugh. All right? That's how much he hates Christians. He wants to be worshipped. <clears throat> now the Christians preach hellfire, right? That there is a real hell and there's hellfire. What Nero did, what is Nero most famous for? They bur he burned down his own city. For what? Yeah, to blame the Christians. See, he would burn down his beautiful city and then pin the blame. You know, Christians are the ones who burn down the city because they preach about hellfire. They want to show that hellfire is real. And he, and he put the blame on Christians. And Christians, and people believe, and Christians got persecuted very badly. Understand trial of your faith? Just because they are Christians. That's all. Just because they are Christians. That is all. Phoebe, are you glad you don't live in Nero's time? Do you want to be a street, street lamb? <laughs> no, right? That was how wicked he was. Right? And he take pleasure in all sorts of ways of killing Christians. Okay? So this is the emperor we talk about. So at that time, you have to remember. So now you have a picture. You take yourself back in time. Peter was writing at a time where Christians live in trembling fear just because you are Christian. What is the easy way out? Okay, we discuss that afterwards. Now, so that is another background you should know. So when you read this, please don't read it very lightly. Yeah, the trial of your faith, uh, gold, mm, gold is very nice. All right? He is trying to convince and assure people that are living at that kind, in that kind of situation. Okay, so when you read all this, you read it with different meaning now. When he says, when, when he says um, don't, don't be like these people. Okay, I just asked. Uh, today maybe I, I, I ask, okay, who's next? Uh? Who's next? Uh, Susan. Susan, I just say, Susan, um, be, just be a Christian in your, in your school and your workplace. Just be a Christian. Are you living in trembling fear? Are you living in trembling? I, say, I just live as a Christian. Don't complain so much. Just live as a Christian. Do you say, okay, fine, I just live as a Christian. No, they're not going to burn me, you know, um, cut my skin off and, and watch, you know, watch me being frayed, flayed, right? No, so it's fine. So here when Peter say, please be a Christian, <laughs> it's very different. Understand that when you read that in your heart is. It's not like us. Now I ask you, do we have any excuse 
to not obey anything in 1 Peter? I ask you, do we have any excuse to not obey anything that God tells us in 1 Peter? No, why no? Because we're not even in like severe Correct, we're not even living in their condition. So now you read 1 Peter with a very different mind and understanding. Right? So, so that is some, that, that are some of the background. <coughs> now, who is it written to? Who is it written to? You look here. So, some more background, huh? at least you know. Now, it's written to, in, who is it written to? Ah, next, Eileen. Eileen. Eileen, right? How do you spell A-I-L-I-N? A-I-L-E-N. 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 Eileen. Right, Eileen. Who is it written to? The stranger from the world. Okay, it's to strangers of, of, of the world. Uh, very good. Right, right. S- strangers scattered through this area: Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All right. So I ask your friend now, Jen. Where are these? <laughs> I think it's difficult. Right? Not very fair. Now at least you have to know roughly. All right. So you roughly know. Now. Okay, my, my map drawing is not very good. Alright, if this is Med- Med- Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Sea, uh, this is sea, alright? Sea. Alright, so this is land. So you have Egypt down here, right? You have Egypt down here. Remember the children of Israel, they left, they left Egypt and then they went northwards, so Israel will be here. Alright, Israel will be by this coast. Okay, and then this would be the places that are named. Understand? The places that are named. Where is this today? Turkey. Wow, very good. <laughs> <laughs> you like Christmas, right? <laughs> Alright, Turkey. Alright, so it's current day Turkey. Current day Turkey. Syria will be here, right? Current day Turkey. That's where he's mentioning. We just finished the book of Ephesus. E- Ephesians, where is Ephesus? All right, Asia in those days is here. Ephesus will be somewhere here. Okay, so at least we know the book of Ephesians. That's where Ephesus is. All right, so he says to these people. Now, he said these people. So he's not writing to any particular congregation. Is this called the first epistle of Peter to the church of Asia? No, it's just simply to the scattered, like Eileen mentioned, the scattered Christians there. Not written to any particular church, so there are there are books that are like that. Now, but I want to I want to ask you, why do you think it's called scattered? Why are they scattered? Next, here's a, why are they scattered? Due to persecution, persecution. All right, so these people are scattered because they were persecuted. They had to run. Wherever they could find safety and can worship God, they would, they would have to do that. So they are probably people that keep needing to move. Now, of course, these were the Jews, right? The Jews were ejected out of Israel because of their disobedience, correct? But at this time, they were scattered. One of the reasons is persecution. Do you need to run every lunchtime? Run away from your, your friends in school? Because they're going to throw you in the toilet bowl? Because you're Christian? No, right? But these people, they are moving, moving, hiding. Right? It's not an easy life. It's not an easy life. Now, so I ask you, so those are some backgrounds, right? So you got useful backgrounds. Actually, I ask you this question. I think it is to answer question number. Um, key purpose of Peter's letter. What do you know? um, This question is for question uh, number. <laughs> okay, we will we will come to that. Don't worry. But I think let's go there. Actually, we, let's not answer question number three. Uh, Question number four, we, we will answer that the next time. But I want to come straight to maybe question number five. Because it's a bit late, I do want to cover this. Question number five, right? Question number five. Now, Peter called 
these people. All right, so we do question number five. We'll come back to the others another time. Don't worry. Now, Peter called the believers strangers. Okay, verse one, right? Strangers. Strangers scattered. So now you know why they're scattered. All right. Now, this word strangers is also translated very often as pilgrims. That's why I put I pilgrims in the Bible, pilgrims. So it's easier for you to understand. Now, why do you think Peter called them strangers? Uh, Elaine, why are they strangers? They always dress very funny. All right, so very good. Now, the, Peter did not want to say to the poor, very suffering, very pitiful Christians, but he called them the strangers. Why do you think he wanted to choose that? Um, Brenda. What Elaine said. Yeah, but okay, strangers means means um wait, you're Singaporean, right? Are you a stranger in Australia, Eileen? Yeah. Yeah, right. Why do you call yourself a stranger here? Because I don't belong. You don't belong here. You call them strangers because when you're a stranger, that means you're strange to that land. I don't really belong to this land. I don't really belong. It's to help them to remember this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Right? Our citizenship is in heaven. Is your citizenship in heaven only if the Lord Jesus Christ is truly your personal saviour? If not, your citizenship is not in heaven. Right? So you have to make sure your citizenship is in the heaven. So, so like Brenda said, why he chose the word strangers rather than say the poor, pitiful, persecuted Christians? Benda, continue. Why? Very good. Keyword. To encourage them. Alright, so this is a very useful word to use for your theme. Okay, another hint. To encourage them. Now, if I would say to the poor, pitiful Christians, will they be encouraged? They'll be discouraged. Say, ah, we are very poor, poor, pitiful. But suddenly, the word stranger suddenly make them think. Ah, I just know that this trial, like Elaine said, all this is temporary. Right, Eileen? Not eating chicken rice and chao kai tiu is just temporary. <laughs> One day I will get to eat it when I go back. Right? So it's temporary. Then you don't get so discouraged. So he chose words very carefully. He chose words, yes. Why do you think he used brothers and sisters? Brothers and sisters would encourage him by saying, I have you all in the same boat, sinking boat. <laughs> right? But to remind them, it's to remind them we are pilgrims. We have another home somewhere. This is temporary, right? So yeah, you're right. Many places, many epistles start with to the brethren, right? But here you want to say to the strangers is to let them know, to remind them this is temporary. We are just passing through, you know? That would be even stronger than calling them brethren. If not, they say brethren, yeah, Peter, you're suffering, I'm suffering, we're all suffering, <laughs> right? But it's, oh yes, this is temporary. They'll be encouraged. They're reminded to press on, okay? Now, so, so that's one thing. Now, why did Peter call them strangers? To remind them, to encourage them that all this is temporary. Are you resisting temptation on earth? You find, ah, oh, yeah, resisting temptation. How long? Or it's difficult to walk. Is it difficult to walk the Christian life on earth? Sometimes it's difficult, right? Now, maybe you don't feel it now, especially in a Christian school. When you start to come out to work, it's not so easy. All right? It's not so easy. Maybe in school already. Do people single you out and laugh at you? Sometimes they do. And not you, right? But sometimes they do. Sometimes when we say, no, sorry, I don't smoke cigarettes. Right? Or I don't, I don't go to these places. I don't watch this. And then they call you, oh, why are you so square? Why are you so strange? And say, yeah, I'm a stranger. <laughs> Scattered in the different universities. I'm a stranger. So suddenly you remember. When they are making fun of you, yeah, I, I am going to be strange. Because I am in a strange land. Alright? Now, what else about this stranger that... So this word is very, very interesting to study, this pilgrim. 
this pilgrim. Oh, what else I want to say? <coughs> um, now, the other thing about stranger um, is alien. You know, do you know you are alien? Wait, are you are you a citizen of Australia? Is your brother a citizen? Oh, so okay, so you are not. An, I'm an alien, right? It means that you are not from this country. Right? Not what movies like to say, alien, all those. I'm not in this country. But this word actually has a connotation of pilgrims and strangers. You live among strangers. Means you live side by side with these people. In other words, it's also a reminder, right? It's a reminder that please know, <coughs> you are not among brethren all the time. You are living side by side with people who consider you strange. Understand that? You don't fit in with them. Okay? That's why they're scattered. Right? So, it's not only reminding them it's temporary, it's reminding them, please know, these people around you in school, these people around you at their workplace, they don't accept you naturally. Right? They don't accept you naturally. So you must realize that we are strangers on this earth. They don't, the world don't necessarily accept us naturally. I think it's increasingly more and more so, right? Do you think so? Example. Wait, who's next? Uh, Jeremy, example. Um, you think your, your army colleagues accept you as a buddy rather than a stranger when you live like a Christian? Why? The family model maybe. Everything is different, right? So the whole point about this stranger is you belong to another city, right? And in those city, you have learned another culture, correct? Another way of thinking. So you have your own way of thinking. You have the culture that you are brought up in. Now you are in a strange land. You will be different from them. They curse and swear. But you are from a different land. The land that you are from, we do not curse and swear. But now, stranger means you will live among people that curse and swear. The Christian must know that. You will live among people that will cheat, that will lie. But the Christian do not cheat, do not lie. You, so the stranger scattered is, you will live among these people. You must know. That is why you must be very careful. All right? We come to that a bit more. So that's another thing I want to emphasize about stranger. Now, another thing is... Um, Don't expect them to accept your ways. Don't expect them to understand and accept your ways. This is another reminder about stranger. That's why he did not want to say, oh, those that are scattered in, in, in um, Bithynia. So you become to the Bithynian Christian. He did not say to the Bithynian Christian. He said to the strangers scattered among Bithynia. You are going to live among these people. You must know that they may not accept you. Your ways are strange to them. Correct? I see Jen nodding a lot. Why? Why do you think so? Do you experience that? No. Okay. You just agree. Can you think of one example, young people, that they will think you're strange? You live among them. You go to school with them. You do lab projects with them. Do you think? The fact that you come to church on Sunday. <laughs> Very good. I wrote that down also. The fact that you go to church. What do you do on Sunday? I go to church. Why do you go to church? Why do you go to the beach with us? Why do you go and play this? Why do you, play? Why do you waste time going to church? To them, they, can, they, they think it's strange. Worse, you may say, no, no. Oh, we're going to have our study group on Sunday. Say, uh, actually, Sunday, I really want to worship God. And I want to go to nursing home. I want to spend the day serving my God. Why are you so strange? You know, if we do this on Sunday. So they will not understand. They cannot understand. Because God is not, not their God. What else? The pressure among teenagers today is what? Maybe not among you. Premarital sex. Premarital sex. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's having a boyfriend and a girlfriend. They're not married, but they're sleeping together. 
all your friends are doing it. To them, you don't do it, you're strange. It's very terrible in America. If you do not lose your virginity, you are strange. Right? So all sorts of things. So you must know that where you come from is going to be, has changed you. But the warning is this, you live among them. You cannot change. Do you understand? I want you to write this down. He called them strangers because he wanted them to remember you must remain a stranger in the land that you're in. You cannot become one of them. You cannot become one of them. Is that the pressure? Yes, that's the pressure. Cheat, lie, when you come out and work, that's the pressure. What happens if when you come out and work and your company says, oh, we are going to label this product this way, but you're working as an engineer, you know it is not true, it's a lie. You'll be under pressure. Are you going to lie? Are you going to cheat? How? The, why, the reason why he used the word stranger is saying, you must remain a stranger. You must remain faithful to the land that you came from and all its values. You cannot change. Remain a stranger. Okay? Alright, so that's one thing that I, I do want us to learn from the book of Peter, from the beginning. If, now look here, they say they're going to have trials, right? Alright? How to not have trials? Next. We're next already. Joshua, how to, have not, how to not have trial as a Christian? No way to escape the trial of just compromise. Just compromise. The whole theme of Peter, not relevant to you. No need. Right? Just compromise. Just compromise, that's it. Uh, cheat a bit, just cheat. Lie a bit, just lie. People go and do this and that, uh, just do it. Huh? So, next time when you go back to the army, it's the same. You're going to face it every day. Just compromise a bit, I will not have trials. That's it. Remain as a stranger. Can? Learn that. The book of Peter is about, I want to summarize, the book of Peter is about encouraging them. Why do you think Peter write this? Okay, come back to question three. Eh? What's the key purpose of Peter's letter? Now you know. What's the key purpose of Peter's letter? To encourage the Christian. Right, to encourage the Christian. You finish the statement for me. Who's next? Yes, Marco. Finish the statement. To encourage the Christian to? Very good. To continue to face trial, persevere, and remain a stranger. Right? Do you think they need that encouragement? They needed that encouragement. Will you need the encouragement? That is what we're going to learn from the book of Peter. You are going to face the same thing. My friends, they're all going here, they're doing that. I want to go. I want to be like them. I want to be accepted among them. You're going to face this, right? And then this encouragement, what we're going to study in the book of Peter is to encourage you, remain a stranger. Because, because why? I like to be strange. Because why? Jo Josiah. Because why? Very good answer. All right, you mean it, huh? Not, not standard answer. Because of verse 7. To encourage you to persevere, remain a stranger, because I come from another land. That land belongs to my King, Jesus Christ. I must glorify Him. Right? <coughs> Understand? So, if I, if I say it another way, Peter is encouraging the Christian to ensure. Okay, if you want to write this down, huh? Peter is ensuring the Christian to ensure that they will respond rightly in trials. That they will respond rightly in trials. So that they will not. Aaron, you finished the statement. So that they will not compromise. They will not compromise. They would not put God to shame. Right? They would not put God to shame. This is what Peter's aim is. Okay? Understand? So it's a bit like that. I look at you. 
you're in university, some of you are in certain work area. I know life is very difficult in being a Christian, and I see some of you are tempted. You know, is tempted to do something. Uh, tempted. And I want you to continue. So I write a letter to you to encourage you. And I keep you focused on what? The glory of God, your homeland. What's the, what's, what's the, what's the slogan of the military? For? Don't have a. Honor and glory. <laughs> for honor and glory, right? Of course, of the country. For honor and for glory of my country. Right? So it's a reminder you are belonging to a citizenship of another country, strangers. Remember the honor of your king. All right, so he wants to encourage them because life is difficult. Now, we come back to some of this and then we will close. There are some other things about um, actually, I think we'll close here. We will come back and we'll answer the rest. Now, ask you, you just look at some of this, all right? You just look at some of this. 5B What are your priorities now? Where should you study? Which country should you live in? How do you make those choices in the light of understanding all this? All right? How should you behave? What is your focus in a strange land? All right? So some of these things uh, we want to study the next time when we come back. So you get an overall picture of what the Apostle Peter is trying to help the people, encourage them in. All right? Then we're going to learn about this. Okay, let's turn to God in prayer. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?